Hello. Am I here? Can anybody hear me? Something again. I just follow orders. I just, I just, you know, say something, something again, something again. Oh, well, Lord, we just uh, thank you for this time together in your spirit and in your word and fellowship. We're just lifting up Robin to you right now, Father. We know that uh, you're the healer, protector, provider, the explainer. Lord, and you can uh, bring glory uh, and uh, attention to you through everything and anything that happens to us, Lord. And we're just trusting you right now as our uh, physician and as our keeper. And uh, we just love you. We just lift her up to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, Kelly. The thought I had when you were talking was, I, I was thinking about, and I'm not that guy, but it just, this is the picture I had of like a guy in a lab looking through a microscope. And he's like, whoa. You know, I mean, he's looking through the microscope and he's seeing something for the first time happening on the little slide. And I, that same idea, you know, the big scale, little scale. I mean, but I heard a guy one time say that uh, God expects or wants us to live our lives in wow and thank you. I mean, that's, that is what he's after. And, and that is what he gets if we start to see it the way he sees it. <laughs> uh, amazing. Well, once again, I have a, you know, uh, I heard someone say one time that, I mean, you know, dictators throughout history have had book burning times, you know, where they go through the community and they gather up all the things they don't want you reading, you know, they put out their propaganda and they, they'll set a fire to everything that's going to give you your own thoughts or freedom. And it's their way of purging their country, nation, community, whatever, of anything they don't want you to know about. And that's horrible. All right. So, but nowadays we have possibly the other problem where we're flooded. I don't know which one's worse, to have books burned where you can't read them, or if you have so many thousands of pieces of information coming at us every day and we don't know what's true. I mean, the result is the same. I don't, I, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know what the truth is because I don't have the book to read, or I don't know what the truth is because I got 70 billion things I'm hearing every day. I, so I think about that sometimes. It's like I can go online and I can find possibly 10, 20, maybe hundreds of people that agree with me. <laughs> then I can find hundreds of people that disagree with me. And then I got to go, this didn't help at all. What do they call that? An exercise in futility. Um, anyway. So once again, I'm hoping all this, this stuff will come together and make sense because I, I feel like I have a whole bunch of different kind of things going on scripturally in my mind here. Um, one of them, <laughs> I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes God shows me things in just seems very odd ways. Earlier I was in the bathroom, and I'm not going to go into any graphic details here, but in the bathroom, there are stalls, right? All right, so... This is how my mind works, if you're brave enough to enter into that place. Um, uh, my job, I get to drive a truck uh, pretty much all day, and a lot of times I find myself going on trips that are about an hour from my workplace to go there and come back. And it's usually in really nice, cool countryside. You know, look at the cows and look at that blue sky. I mean, it's just... I think I'm getting paid for this. Sometimes I'm just blown away by it. Well, one day I saw these cows and I saw this little calf and it was jumping around. I, and this is not something I see on a regular basis. I'm, I mean, I see cows a lot, but I don't see, you know, I mean, when's the last time you saw anybody say, I saw a cow jumping? Well, pretty much only when it's a little bitty calf, right? I mean, you're not gonna, mama cows are like, I'm not jumping. But so little, little baby calf literally jumping. I mean, it's like a 
puppy. Now, what do you think my immediate response was? My immediate response was joy. That cow doesn't know I saw it. The cow didn't say anything, but it's jumping over there in that field just brought joy inside of me. I mean, who doesn't understand that? You know, a little cow jumping up and down. So I was in the bathroom, stall, cow jumping. Oh my gosh, there's a verse came to my mind. This is, I knew it was God because I don't ever, I never think about this. Who thinks about this? Malachi 4, verse 2 says, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. <laughs> Most of the times when someone compares you to a cow, it's not very friendly or fun, and it's negative, and you're really being mean. <laughs> But I just thought, you'll go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You know, here you are, you're pent up all night in the stall. You know, you're bound up and you're like, I just want to get out there. I just want to, what is going on out there? I want to skip. I just want to run. <laughs> that to me is a description of joy. I think that's what that's defining. And, uh, I am generally not a big exuberant, emotionally expressing kind of guy as far as, you know, well, I guess maybe compared to my wife, um, maybe compared to some others I would be, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening in here. <laughs> I heard a story one time about a little boy that kept getting into trouble and the, and the mama said, you sit down. And he goes, all right, I'm going to sit down, but I'm standing up on the inside. All right, so years ago, I don't know if I shared this yesterday or not, uh, you know, something about telling your own story gets you because you tell it, it's your story. So you tell it, if you do it, if you're like me, you tell it a lot as far as what Christ is. So I don't remember if it was yesterday or, or seven weeks ago, you know, I, but um, I used to have this job and this, one of this, I, I delivered medicine actually. Uh, for six pharmacies, and one of the pharmacists I actually knew him really well. My mom uh, basically raised his children. You know, she babysit his kids. One day we were having a conversation, and he said to me, "Don't you ever want to do anything for your fellow man?" This was before I had Christ in me, and I was, you know, self for self. And I said, "No. Why would I do that? It made no sense to me. Do something for they got to do their own thing." I, I'm, I'm trying to take care of me, you know, and there, that's selfish in one respect, but in another respect, it makes total sense because if I'm not straight here, how am I going to help anybody anyway? I mean, how, if I'm not settled, if I'm not stabilized on the inside, how in the world can I do anything? How can I do it? I mean, if we're both in the water drowning, I can't rescue you. I got to be in the boat. <laughs> when you're in the boat, then you can help the other person back into the boat. All right, so I was just thinking about this and how we go through such a time, you know, even to, just to become a Christian, to say a prayer and invite Christ in, without saying anything about all this, what we talk about here, this deep, you know, what is the flesh and Christ in me, Christ is my life. I mean, that is, I'm not even talking about that. I mean, just the process of getting to a place where you're open to receive Christ, just even there is a lot of a shakeup, it seems like. But then when Christ moves in, now all these emotions and thoughts and feelings and troubles are still there. And you're like, well, I thought this was going to get fixed. Especially the way a lot of people share the gospel as though it's going to fix all that. But that's not really, that's not really it, right? What I, so if I want, I want to show you something. I got a bunch of verses, which I may not be able to get through all this, but in 2 Corinthians... The first chapter, Second Corinthians 1, I'll get there. It's right after 1 Corinthians. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Second Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul opens this letter to the Corinthians. Uh, 
talking about how Christ, essentially what he's saying is Christ in me is for others, even at my own peril. He'd come to a place where he realized that everything that happened to him or in him or through him in his life or around him wasn't about him and it was for others. So the Apostle Paul, I don't, can anybody tell me where the verse is where the Apostle Paul said, why is this happening to me? The Apostle Paul said, you know, somewhere, didn't he? Why is this happening to me? <laughs> I'm being facetious. <laughs> he never said that. <laughs> That's my point. He, he's in prison. He's been beaten. Lowered down in a back. All this stuff happened to him, and he never once said, why is this happening to me? Ooh, the apocryphal book of Third Timothy. Now we know why it's not in the canon. Okay. 2 Corinthians 1. I'm going to read verses 3 through 10. Don't get scared. I'm not going to pull apart every one of these verses. Just, but I want you to see the whole point here because it culminates in the meaning of life. That's right. You, right here, are about to hear the answer to the age-old question, what is the meaning of life? 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 10. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. If you didn't catch it, there it is. There's the meaning of life. Verse 10, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. So Paul said, Corinthians, uh, you know, if we've been afflicted, if, we, if we've been afflicted, it's for your comfort. And if we've been comforted, it's for your comfort. So Paul's saying, every single thing that happens in and around and to me and, and about me in my life is for you to be comforted. No one would come up with that apart from the Spirit of God. <laughs> How would you ever come up with that? So verse 9 is what I want you to see. Verse 8, he says, I don't want you to be unaware of the trouble and, the, and affliction we've experienced, even despairing unto our own very own life. But look at verse 9. Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves. Why? Why, Paul? Why would you have this sentence of death? So that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. The meaning of life. Why am I going through all this? So we don't trust in ourselves, but in God. Why are you going through that? So that you don't trust in yourself, but in God who raises even the dead. Why, why am I living? So that I learn not to trust in myself, but in God who raises the dead. Lucifer got kicked out of heaven, right? Do we agree on that? Why? Because he trusted in himself and not God. So how are we going to get to heaven? How are we going to be in heaven? How are we going to live there? How are we going to exist there? Because we don't trust in ourselves but in God. This life is about learning not to trust in ourselves but in God. If we're going to live in a state of perfection one day in heaven, God's not going to have this rebellion again. We're being fixed in this life. 
fixed, prepared, established, convinced, transformed for the next, or the continuation. It's not really a next, but it's, you know what I'm saying. So in heaven one day, we're not going to go, you know, I think I could be like God. Because we've already got it established here. We already got convinced that it don't work. Right? How can we sing the song? No more sorrow there. If we haven't learned to stop trusting in ourselves. <laughs> how can we have that song? How can we believe that? How can, I mean, what, what is perfect, beautiful, glorious heaven if there's this opportunity for us to trust in ourselves and blow it? Amazing. I mean, it just blows my mind. So how do so I got I get settled? Christ moves in. I get settled. I get my feet planted spiritually speaking, and then I realize, you know what? I'm whole and complete. So all this stuff happening to me doesn't change that. It doesn't. It doesn't. Rock, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't rock you or shock you at first, but but it doesn't bump you off of it because your your foundation is solid. The wind comes, the storm comes, right? You know the story. Jesus is talking about building your house on the sand or on the rock. Well, if you're in Christ, it's, it's stable. You can have a lot of shutters and, and shingles knocked off along the way. <laughs> but you can still live in this house. It's still stable in here. Once that happens, you really get off of yourself, which is, I'm telling you, it's a miracle. A guy that was a pharmacist said, don't you ever want to do anything for your fellow man? I'm like, immediately, no. No, why? What are you talking about? That made no sense to me. Because to me, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world out here. And I was wearing milk bone underwear. <laughs> I had to do... <laughs> I couldn't resist. I, I, had, I had to do what was right for me to get through, and you do what you got to do. I mean, an independent I. I'm independent. You're independent. Wouldn't you like to be independent, too? So we're, we, that's the way the world is. I got to make it, you know, get out of my way. You're in my way. Or, oh, you're helping me get what I want. Okay, I like you. You know, I mean, that's the mind of the world. So to get born again, all of a sudden... And, and that comes from a, a vacuum inside that is empty and unstable as a lost person. When Christ moves in, he goes, all of a sudden you're like, <gasps> Kelly's like, wow, right? All of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, there's peace, there's contentment, there's stability, there's, I, I don't, all this needy, needy, gnawing neediness is gone. Well, what do you do now? Well, first you're enamored with Christ himself, and that never really goes away. But then all of a sudden you start realizing, oh, my gosh, I want everybody to have this stability and this contentment and this, and this peace that I have. It's not much different than buying weed back in the old days. <laughs> I mean, I'd go get pot, and I didn't go hole up in a room somewhere and smoke it all myself. No, I want to find my buddies, man. Man, you're going to believe this. Well, Christ moved in, and guess what? Hope dealer, right? On the prowl. I want everybody hooked on hopium. <laughs> I mean, that, everybody needs to try this. Twice the buzz and none of the guilt. All right. <laughs> no high like the most high alright so 2 Corinthians 4 as calves skipping from the stall um, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 we have this treasure in an earthen vessel so Paul says my comfort is for your comfort and my troubles are for your comfort <laughs> Everything that happens to me and everything that happens to me is somehow for your help and your comfort. And, that, and that's true in, in lots of ways. One way is, is someone like me or lots of you guys will get up here and talk about how horrible your life was. Bad choices, bad treatment, but God. You know, at the end, you always put that but God on there. And all of a sudden, the person listening somewhere is going, man, that sounds like my stuff. Mine, I was that dark and awful, too. 
but God. So there's hope. Now, all that stuff that you thought was a waste of your life is actually comforting someone else. So it's ingredients in the mix, right? So Paul is saying here, he's saying, look, we have this, we're, we got a treasure inside of this earthen vessel, verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Amen. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Oh my gosh, the life of Jesus manifests in our mortal flesh. The life of Jesus manifests in our mortal flesh. The Spirit of God operating in our mortal flesh. And what would he do? Be for others. Because that's who he is. Verse 12. So death works in us, but life in you. <laughs> Somehow, all this junk in my life is going to bring life to you. And you're thinking, how can that happen? Well, it's only a miracle. That's the only reason it happens. <laughs> Verse 13, but having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Look at this, for all things are for your sakes. So that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Here's what I really wanted to focus on, verse 16, 17, and 18. Therefore, since all that's true, that's what all that's there for, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. I'm telling you, I, I, I think I was close to becoming a news junkie at one point. And I could see how that makes you lose heart. Because there's no hope and no answer in that. Brian Cotney told me a long time ago, he said, you can watch the news and all you're seeing is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because one side's going, we're good and you're evil. And the other says, no, we're good and you're evil. And there's no answer. And you know why I know there's no answer? Because it's a 24-hour news cycle. It never ends. If there was an answer, it would end. So don't lose heart. Verse 16, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. These two things are happening at the same time. As our outer man is aging and dying off and hurting, and <laughs> hmm. the inner man is being renewed. Look at verse 17. For momentary light affliction. Someone comes to you and you lost your job and you got a raging addiction and your wife don't like you anymore and you go, oh, it's just momentary light affliction. And then you recover from your swollen eye and you go, oh, but this was for you. Momentary light affliction is producing or working for us. Not against us. That right there is another one of those wow moments. All this junk. Okay, I would do this if this wasn't happening. Oh, man, I would be so much better off if that happened, if this didn't happen. And Paul's going, nope. All that stuff is actually not working against you at all. It's working for you. It says, mine says it's producing or working for us an eternal weight of glory. Light affliction is working eternal weight far beyond all comparison. Well, how does this work? Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary or temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. The more seen and felt stuff that seems to be coming against us, when we, find, when we really see that it's working for us is when we realize if it wasn't for all that, I wouldn't be looking to the unseen. It's driving me to trust the unseen. I can't trust all this stuff I'm looking at and feeling. I cannot do it. Not, it's not saying it isn't happening. 
Paul said, if I'm going through affliction, it's for your comfort. If I'm going through, if I have comfort, it's for your comfort. He completely stopped seeing him, it, it being about him. Tracy, <laughs> Tracy, I don't know if Sylvia, who said this originally, but Tracy's picked this up. She said, it's not about you, but it includes you. And that gets said almost every day, probably at our house at some point. There's something about that that makes you go, oh, that's right. It's not about me. And I think that's what he's saying here in one, in one respect. Paul's saying it's not about me, but it includes me. It's not about you, but it includes me. All right, one more place, and I'll, I'll be done. We're about there, aren't we? So you know what I did? That's funny. I wrote the chapter and verse down, but I didn't write what book it was in. <laughs> but I think, I, rem I think it's Luke. Luke 22. Good, good thing I remember. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Luke 22, 31 and 32. This gets brought up a lot in our Sunday school class because I just think this is what, I don't know, I think this is it. Luke 22, 31 and 32. Jesus speaking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan has demanded to sift Peter, and Jesus said, I'll pray that he doesn't hurt you too bad. He doesn't say that. He doesn't pray that he gets out of it. You know, I'm going to tell you, you know, you know a really quick way to uh, cause problems with your brothers and sisters in your church, I can tell you how to do it. When they ask you to come pray with them and they want you to pray them out of something and you pray this prayer, you say, Lord, I'm not praying that you take it from them or get them out of it. I'm just praying that their faith holds up. They won't come and ask you to pray with them again. I'm, I'm just telling you from my own experience. Because I think sometimes we want out of stuff that God wants us through. And uh, why would he want us through? Because when we come through, we turn and strengthen others. So if we're afflicted, it's for your comfort. And if, if I'm comforted, it's for your comfort. While well, we look not at the seen, but at the unseen. So it sounds like you're this prophet and you're this seer of the future by telling people God is doing something amazing. And you're like, I don't know, I'm in the hole in jail. You're telling me this is great? And then when it does turn out to bring glory, they go, how did you know that? <laughs> like, that's how it works. And now you have a job. Now you turn and strengthen the people that come up behind you because of what you've been through. And you, those ingredients are now making their cake <laughs> all right well i guess I'm, i i mean i could do this all